So let's see a use after free vulnerability that's caused by a race condition. And if you're like me, you've always thought to yourself, what is a teletype? Well, here you go. A teletype is a printer that is a communication device with a keyboard similar to a typewriter that enables you to send and receive printed messages. So those old fashioned teletype machines are the basis for our modern terminals. So nowadays we deal with virtual terminals, but these were the actual physical terminals terminating connections to large mainframe machines. And here someone took a 1930s teletype and used it to set up a terminal connecting to their Linux machine. So TTY, teletype, so the, the abbreviation TTY, when you're looking at operating systems like Linux, that is coming from teletype, and it was a terminal device connected to real hardware. What we actually deal with these days are pseudo terminals or PTYs, and that is a pair of TTYs used for things like opening a GUI terminal or SSHing into a machine. So basic TTY on a Linux system is usually exclusively an input or an output device. So you could have the device exposed in slash dev slash TTY 14, and that could be like a MIDI keyboard. Or TTY 22 could be a monitor out. But what we care about is that there is a structure behind the scenes that we're going to be intimately involved in in this particular section, which has some interesting properties to it. Now, for those pseudo terminals, which is what you are actually normally using, like I said, that's a pair of TTYs, one for each side of input and output. And Linux refers to them as the master and the slave. So the master writes information to the slave. So for instance, this literal typing in TTY that is going over to the slave. And then the output from that command can be read by the master back from the slave. So to connect to these sort of TTYs, you would open, for instance, using the open syscall slash dev slash PTMX, which stands for pseudo terminal multiplexer. And opening that would give you the file descriptor for the master TTY. And then to open a connection to the slave, you would take and pass the master file descriptor into PTS name, PTS standing for pseudo terminal slave name. That would look up the slave name based on the master, and that would be slash dev slash PTS zero, for instance. And then you are calling open on slash dev slash PTS zero. And then you will have a file descriptor for the slave TTY that corresponds to the master TTY that you passed in to the PTS name. Okay, so we said that each of these TTYs is represented by a TTY struct, and those are going to be interesting to us. So when you're specifically dealing with a master-slave relationship pseudo terminal, there will be a linked list linkage here from the master to the slave and from the slave back to the master. Now hold that thought about TTYs for a second. We're going to talk about ioctals and then how they pertain to TTYs. So ioctals or input output control codes are an interface from user space to the kernel. So it's one of the most common attack surfaces on the kernel. And there are specifically ioctals that can be executed on TTYs for what's called job control. That has to do with the notion that processes in the operating system can be grouped into a process group. So this process group has five processes underneath it, and this process group has two. And the idea of process groups is that they can be used to send a signal to the group, and then you'll make sure that it gets sent to all of the sub-processes. So if a sigint or a control C comes into this process group, then it'll make sure that it gets distributed to process six and process seven. Additionally, and this is what we're going to care about for this type of vulnerability, for those ioctals, there is one of them to move processes between groups. So you can, for instance, say set process five to be in process group two, and then boom, it gets moved over there. And now whatever gets sent to process group two will be sent to process five. So back to the TTY struct, the field in TTY struct PGRP process group is a struct PID type. So it is a pointer to a struct PID type. So that is going to point at a struct PID, and each of these is going to point at the same PID. There is then a TTY struct control lock that enforces mutual exclusion on process group PID access. So mutual exclusion, this is one of our words of power. So 
And then within the PID structure, there is a count field, which is the reference count, which is another one of our words of power. It's the reference count for this PID structure. It's trying to basically say how many things are currently holding a reference to this particular structure. And right here, we can see that there's two of them. Two of them each have this process group pointing at the PID, right? It is a struct PID pointer and it points at this PID and they use their locks in order to enforce mutual exclusion. Now I wanna drill down a little bit on how the reference counting for this PID structure works. And I want to highlight specifically the keywords retain and release, yet more words of power. We've got a lot of words of power going on, a lot of hints here. So there's a general notion in object-oriented programming or in situations where you have automatically garbage collected things that a retain will increment a count of how many references there are to a thing and release will decrement that count and release something from being treated as referring to something else. So there are two functions here, get PID and put PID. And I just wanna say that those are functionally equivalent to get PID is retain and put PID is release. So retain and release are important because this increments and this decrements. But if this decrements down to zero, so if this atomic deck end test on the count, if this count would subsequently be decremented down to zero, meaning that there are no more things that reference this struct, then the automatic garbage collection should go ahead and free that PID. So release is basically just a sort of auto freeing mechanism. It only frees if you've successfully decremented all the references. Otherwise, most of the time it's just doing a decrement. All right, now back to those ioctals. So for the ioctal tty uh, man page, we know that it can call ioctal and the file descriptor that is passed in here could be a master or it could be a slave if the thing that you're operating on is a PTY, a pseudo terminal. Then the command to execute is going to be fully attack controlled as well. And it can be one of these things that are defined in the man page, but we're going to specifically focus on this one and I'll give the acronym what it stands for in a second. But this particular command takes this particular argument, so some pointer to a PID type, which in user space will usually just be an opaque handle. So in user space, you call ioctal, pass a file descriptor for the master or slave, pass the command, we're gonna say it's this command, and then pass an opaque thing saying, here's the PID that I'm interested in. Okay, now here's the kernel space side, and this is where the vulnerabilities are, and this is the code you're gonna be looking at. On kernel side, we've got the TTY, that is the attacker could have passed one for the master or the slave. And then we've got all of these cases for all of these different commands, right? So we said command was again, one of those attack controlled things. And so for instance, this command is TTY IO control set controlling TTY, TTY IO control get process group, TTY IO control set process group, and TTY IO control get session ID. So those are what those abbreviations stand for, but this is the one that we're specifically gonna care about. But there's one important comment in the code before we get into that, and that is that if the TTY is a PTY, then real TTY is the slave side. So basically we said this TTY can be either the master or the slave, but if it is a PTY, so if it was some master or slave type organized pair of TTYs, then before we even get to this point, the real TTY is guaranteed to be the slave side. So this can either be slave and slave, or it can be master and slave. Cool, so now we are finally ready to try to find the flaw. So based on the particular command, we get into this TTY IO control set process group. That's why I told you about things like process groups and how a particular process could be moved between groups. This is the kernel side code that would do that sort of thing. But now looking at this code, Understanding that put PID is effectively a release and get PID is effectively a retain. Take a look at this code and see if you can find the flaw with respect to use after free vulnerabilities. And one last hint, and that is that Linux ioctals, we said they serve as an interface between user space and kernel, but there can potentially be many CPUs interacting with the kernel interface in parallel. All right, go take a look at the code, go check out the full code and look around and find the flaw.